Now, um, you know, it's more than just, like I said, he goes on, he says, um, no change is so swift as from love of honor to love of money in a young man. Firstly, then, he would be like the oligarchic state, in prizing money most highly, and further, in being parsimonious and hardworking, in fulfilling only necessary desires of his household and refusing all other expenditures, enslaving his other, let's see, his other's um, desires as vain. A shabby creature and a hoarder, making profit from everything. Those are the ones and the multitude that the multitude praises. Would not such be the man who is like the Constitution? So he goes on. He, sa he says, ah, yes, at least money is chiefly honored both by the city and of the man. Oh, yes. That, I think, is because he has not attended to education. <laughs> now, the word in education for the Greeks, the one that we translate as education, the actual world called paideia. And paideia just simply meant the making of a man. Somebody who handles their responsibilities, somebody who understands duty, somebody who understands courage. That was the whole purpose of an education. They don't have that. The only thing they have is calculating how to make more. He says, and that's where the danger comes in. Remember the, the idea of culture, the cult, right? Cultivation. Now, um, now, this is key, you know, responsibility. By the way, this is an aside. Goes back to Marxism just for a second. You know, people always think Marxism and Karl Marx is all about setting up socialism. What Karl Marx was interested in was the destruction of the family. The destruction of the family. He even says this, get rid of the family. I mean, that's the key thing. In other words, you start by getting rid of you. If you can get people to focus only on money, only on materialism. By the way, that's what's odd about the communists. You know, the communists always make fun of capitalists saying they're hung up on money. But if you think about it, what, what's, what, for the, what is the answer that socialists and, and communists have? Yeah, they want, they want the money. <laughs> In other words, not fixing problems of greed or anything like that. It, it's based off the same thing. It's still greed. It's just lazy greed. <laughs> okay, but anyway, uh, but this is what they see. Now, he goes on. He says, um, you know, once you destroy the family, basically, civilization's gone. He says, and this is something, by the way, that our founding fathers were well aware of. You know, you need this family. But again, a true education, that is an understanding that virtue and civilization are things that have to be cultivated. This is not valued by people in an oligarchic society because, what do they say? He says, may we not suppose that dronish desires come up in him. This is, this is um, you know, the, the, this guy's children. He says, because of their lack of education. Some beggarly, some criminal, but they're restrained forcibly by his general careful, carefulness. You see, the only thing, the only virtue that an oligarchic people have is they're thrifty. But they're not thrifty because they think it's better to be. They're thrifty because they don't want to lose what they have. Okay. Um, yeah, he, he says, he restrains evil desires which are within him. He does not persuade them that it is better not, nor tame them by reason, nor did, he does it by compulsion and terror, trembling for his other property. This is the other thing that you'll basically see, and this is something we see in even if we look at, at the way we, we teach economics and stuff. In other words, we're under this idea that greed is something that we can harness. Think about how we play with the tax structure. We think, oh yeah, greed, it can be used as neutral. Instead of saying greed's bad, we say, no, we'll encourage it a certain way. Like, you know, if we have budget problems, we'll play on greed. We'll have a lottery. And we'll use it for good purposes. You can never use evil for good purposes. By the way, if you want proof of that, you can look at what happens with lottery systems. Let me show you lotteries. Let me show you about lotteries. This is something else. It hasn't happened here as much because people didn't play it as much, but I've lived in other states, Kentucky and wherever. Let me show you how lotteries work. Because again, we haven't addressed greed. Here's the budget. Okay, here. Here's what we spend. Okay, now the thing is, there's only two ways to fix that. You either raise tuition, you either raise tuition, I'm a professor. <laughs> you either raise taxes or you lower spending. That's the only two ways. There is no other two ways, okay. 
But we think, oh, no, no, we'll play on greed. We'll do a lottery because it'll be voluntary. Let me show you what happens when you have a lottery. Most states, actually, we didn't hit this uh, because our lottery was more of a failure. <laughs> but if it's successful, it's even worse. A lot of states, like if you look like Kentucky and places like this, they actually bring in more money than what they had planned. Say, so, see, I told you, greed can work. The problem is, once we start bringing in this amount of money, <clears throat> what's the legislature going to do? They're going to spend more. They're going to spend more. So if it's a conservative legislature, they'll spend this much. If the liberal will spend more. But let's make, it'll be Oklahoma woman. Huh? Well, anyway, so-called conservative, okay. All right, now the problem is, is this. Eventually the new ways off, wears off. Not as many people play or a neighboring state gets it, whatever. And what happens? Well, revenues go down. Now, revenues may actually still be higher than what it was before we started the lottery, but the problem is the spending's higher. Yeah. Greed is bad. You can't use it as a tool. And that's what happens. Again, the people that come up with these plans are people who don't have a proper education, ones that can only like, play with numbers but don't understand human nature. Anyway. Okay. Let's go on. Sorry. Okay. So what happens? So um, how does it basically, how does the oligarchy begin to decline? He talks about this. He says, the oligarchy changes into a democracy something in this way, he says, through its insatiate desire for that which it sets before itself as good and a duty to become as rich as possible. The rulers hold their positions because of their great possessions, and they will, let's see, they will not make laws against undisciplined young men to prevent any um, who may turn up from running through their fortunes. They hope to lend money on the property of such men and then buy it up and so become richer and more honorable than ever. So, we, let's see, um, so in the oligarchies, by overlooking or even encouraging intemperance, they have sometimes compelled men not ignoble to become paupers. Let's talk about the great thing of capitalism. Capitalism has one great thing, and this is true. There's nobody that can argue this. You want to basically have the most efficient system of allotting goods and resources, capitalism got it. I mean, by the way, if you, if you doubt that, go ask people in the former Soviet Union. There's a reason it's the former Soviet Union. That's the plus. It can meet needs. That's the plus. And that's what it was designed for. You go back and read Adam Smith, that's what it's for. Adam Smith didn't see what we have now. Uh, not completely. Wait, which one said that? Not, not completely. Go ahead. He did. He did. But it wasn't what he planned for. Um, you know, his, his idea was you, had, you still had artisans, you still had people like this. I think he still thought there would be some restraint. Because there was at that time. There was restraint a little bit more. The good thing about capitalism, it meets this. The problem is once you've met the needs, once you've met those needs. Now again, this is the thing. I want to stress this. Profit's not bad, business is not bad, capitalism is not bad. Capitalism's neutral. The deal is what happens once you've lost virtue as well? It has to be honorable and honest. Because remember, pure capitalism, you know, Pablo Escobar could play that game. The problem is, is this, and this is where he says the danger is. If it only becomes meeting needs are great. The problem is if we get focused on once we've met the needs, and, and again, meeting desires is okay. I think that's okay. You, in other words, not asking people just to live with your, with your needs. If you've got extra, go ahead and spend it. The problem is, is what happens when you still want more, and it's more than just their wants, you want to create new wants. Go ahead, that's all right. That's true. And we all, our values, what well, we value, like a hamburger or potato chips or whatever, I mean, that changes from time to time, day to day value is subjective. And part of the thing is with this life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is that we get to decide individually. That's right. What that is. We don't have the government telling us what should be. That's right. 
The danger becomes, the danger becomes when those who still want profit will also use the government to cover it, to, to. Well, yeah, when you're using. Yeah. Let me, let me use his example and you'll agree. Yeah, then you've got That's the problem. And so the problem is, is this. Once upon a time, what we, what we try to do is, is you want to keep selling, selling, selling. Now, originally the point is, okay, if there's no more money, stop selling. Yeah. But then we create debt. Okay. Which we're good at to get more and more and more. But then the second thing is, is we also want to create a culture where we get rid of restraint. Now, here's the thing. Let's say you're just interested in selling, just interested in selling. Who's the best group of people to sell stuff to? Who doesn't have restraint? Hmm? Besides government, yes. <laughs> you said it. Children. And so the notion is, if you can infantilize people, if you can get old people to behave like children, if you can get them to want, 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 slowly, slowly, slowly reduce that impulse of self-control. This is the danger. And so this is why I said allowing people to go through stuff when they don't have it. Again, here's the thing. Let's go, let's go on back to this. By the way, and this goes back, you're going to agree with the second part. Hold on, we're getting there. <laughs> One step ahead of me on this. He says, he says here is, a, is an evil blazing up, which they do not want to quench, although they could in two ways. One is what I suggested, by preventing a man from turning his property to any purpose he liked. Okay, that's one, okay. The other was, is basically, okay, so in other words, here's one we used to have. This is his first one. In other words, you've got to put limits on it. Once upon a time, if you wanted to buy a house, what? You had to have a down payment. You had to have a down payment. That's just it. In other words, we, we said, well, you can't use everything because we are going to deny you credit. You had to have a down payment. Okay? Now, the way we got rid of, rid of that, though, was we started creating, said, oh, no, 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 we're going to encourage greed. And we remember Bill Clinton with the Fairness and Housing Act. Fairness and Housing Act was, well, there's minorities who, who aren't able to get these houses. Now, the reason was they didn't have enough for a down payment. But he made it look more inclusive. That created trouble. Then, George Bush II, dumb Bush, not smart Bush, the second one came along. And instead of saying, that isn't right, he went one step beyond. He said, well, he said, no, no, that's reverse racism because we're giving, you know, we're allowing minorities to, to you know, get more credit. And he says, instead, and so instead of stopping doing that, instead of stopping minorities from going into debt that they couldn't pay, what did he do? He gave poor white people the same ability to run themselves. In other words, you don't have to put that much down. Now, still, still you would be correct on this. Still, there might be a way to get out of that. But here's the second thing when he combined. He goes on, he says, so that was the first way. He says, there's a second way, he says, another way, he says, the next best law, one that compels the citizens to care for virtue. For if it laid down that in most of the, you'll agree with this one, most of the voluntary contracts, a man must act of his own risk. People in the city would not be so shameless in their dealings and not so many of those evils we have mentioned would come about at all. So in other words, we could also say, okay, you wanna go ahead and Loan them, it's on you. If you lose it, it's on you. That's right. That's exactly right. In other words, that's right. No. That's right. That's right. That's right. So he did, he did both. In other words, we've encouraged one and then we've encouraged the other. So we've encouraged some to go out and borrow, borrow more. And then we encourage the lenders to keep giving, giving, giving because we're going to back it even if you make bad loans. Exactly. And this is what he said. Remember, 2,500 years ago. Go ahead. The government forced the lenders and lend the people that could not pay it. 
That would be the first part of the equation. That's the fairness in housing and stuff like that. That's right. That's the first part of the equation. Yeah, I'm making both points. Yeah. That's right. It's that's right. But both equations. The first part is what you guys are saying. That's the first thing he said. In other words, it's going to make you loan, make loans. That's right. That's the first part. And then the. That's right. That's the first part. And then the and then the second part of the equation is what he said next, which was, which was no risk. Which again, your tarp bailouts, all of this. Now again, what message did that send when you had the tarp bailouts? That's right. That's a, in other words, we're doing two different things. We've had both problems. Does that make sense? He said, you know, fix one or the other, and you would have been okay. Preferably both. Yeah. There's a little politics involved in all that, too. That's right, because remember, what does what society all come about? It's all about politics. Money. Yeah. So that's an example of all these schemes are socializing the costs and privatizing the profit. Yes, we're all paying. We're all paying. That's right. And that's the point. The second point is the one you were making. Yeah, that's why I was saying, you know, either one, but the second one. Was, and I agree with you, the second one on this one. But again, and this is, again, this is what we have. And again, what message did that send bankers? And by the way, what message did that send community bankers and, and um, people that played by the rules? They were suckers. That's right. That's what message it sent them. And I don't know if you've noticed in the last few years how many, how many community banks and regional, small regional ones have gone under. We've lost over half of them. Yeah. How does this fit into this cell phone deal? Free, telephone, uh, free phones. You and I pay $3 a month, okay, for the underprivileged to enjoy a free phone. But now it's not just a free phone, it's a free iPhone. That gets us when we get to democracy. Let's stay on the oligarchy first. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that part next. Trust me, we're going to get to that. Okay, so this is the old oligarchy. Now, the other major problem that we have in this society is, since it focuses exclusively on money, what type of person is it going to create? Well, people that can only think about money. By the way, here's the thing. You know, Democrats always talk about, oh, Republican, you know, fat cats, rich fat cats. Here's the thing. The problem is in this type of society we've created, who's hung up on money? Everybody is. Everybody is. It's not just wealthy, it's poor too. And if you don't believe it, you know, look at who gets shot for wearing, you know, the, the new red tennis shoes or whatever. Does that make sense? Everybody is focused on it. That's, that's the status pin. The other thing you have to look at it, you know, well, let me keep going. Um, by the way, the, the, the reason we have, we think, well, how do we get to this point? Well, traditionally, traditionally, there were two ways to keep people in check and to get votes or to keep staying power. One way, the easiest way, is shoot them. But that has limitations, actually. You know, you, you realize all, well, no, but literally all totalitarian governments, they're limited. I mean, they can only shoot people for so long, okay? The other way, which is what, which is what the Greeks said, and actually what Washington believed, was something called like-mindedness. Uh, the Greeks call the homonoia, that is, that you're in the same boat. By the way, this is what Washington said in his farewell address. He said this, he says, for this you have every inducement of sympathy and interest, citizens by birth or choice of a common country. That country has the right to concentrate your affections. The name of American which belongs to you in your national capacity must always exalt just pride of patriotism. Get this, with slight shades of differences, you have the same religion, manners, habits and political principles. That's right. Now those are the two original ways, okay? The problem is what we've come up with is a third option in the modern world. And the third option of keeping people in line is economic manipulation. That is, make it in people's economic interest. If you vote for us, we'll constantly make it better, better, better. And if you can only think about stuff, and by the way, we're not just talking about, like, I know they're thinking, well, that's what the Republicans say, grow the economy. It's the Democrats giving free cell phones, free stuff, free stuff. And you can look at, at how many governments do this. This is eventually what got the Soviet Union. You know, basically, yeah, we'll guarantee you a job. We'll keep doing this. Yeah, it worked, worked real well. You know, you had Brezhnev, you know, era, the golden age of 
socialism, but eventually it runs out. And by the way, even if it couldn't run out, which it does, even if it didn't run out, the problem if, with this system is how much crap at Walmart do you have to buy before you're happy? How many have ever seen TLC show hoarders? Are any of those people happy? In other words, we've replaced it with just stuff. So again, but again, it does run out. That's the problem too. Okay. Um, let's see. Now let's go how we get from this to the mob, okay, uh, to when he gets to democracy, and then we'll get to tyranny. How do we get from, from oligarchy to tyranny? And he talks about this. Basically, I'll tell you what, I'm going to move through this a little quicker. Um, what happens is, is think of the children of this guy, of the oligarch. This guy, what's the only thing he can think of? Money. And it's the only thing he knows. And so what happens is his children, they've been handed everything. They get everything. And so, yeah, they have everything. And so what happens basically is this. All the, they hang around their little friends who want more and more. They want to spend more and more and more and more. And his father will come say, you know, you need to not spend so much. But the problem is, what does his son not understand? The difference between what and what? Right and wrong. He expects that this is just the way it is. It's just natural. And he goes on, he says, then again, when the desires are banished, in other words, he, 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 his father comes and explains he doesn't need this. He says, others grow up through the father's lack of knowledge of right upbringing, and these become many and strong. Then they draw him back to his associations, in other words, his, his, his bad companions, and they spawn secretly a breed of multitudinous brood. So in the end, they storm the fortress of the young man's soul, and they find it empty of truth, which are indeed the best sentinels and guardians in the minds. Says, now, again, his friends come. He says, now liars and impostors, false words and opinions charge up and occupy the place of the others in such a man. So then the young man comes back among the lotus eaters. You know, like this is a reference to Odyssey, you know, where they have like the, you know, the hippies. Okay. <laughs> he says, the lotus eaters. He says, um, who make his home there op op openly. If any support comes from his family or the thrifty part of his soul, those bragging words bar up the gates of the royal castle in him and will not let even these allies or, or, um, or even receive any embassy of words from his older friends or, or his father. He says, a battle follows and they win. Now he's talking about, you know, all his friends, you know, who are trying to get him to spend. He says, shame they dove as silliness and cast it forth. Temperance they dove as cowardice, trample it underfoot and banish it. They persuade the man that moderation and decent spending are clownishness and vulgarity. Violence is now good breeding. Anarchy is liberty. Licentiousness is magnificence. Immodesty is courage. Does this sound familiar? Come on. There you see more or less how the young man who is being trained among necessary desires is led into the emancipation and release of unnecessary and, and, and unprofitable pleasures. Um, so he goes on and on and on. Now, if that's not bad enough, you know, you got these kids that expect everything, then what do you do? Well, then, you know, they grow up and you send them to some college town. And what happens there? You know, some university city. Um, and they get exposed to relativists or Marxists or whatever. And he goes on, he says, and not a word of truth does he receive into the fortress of his soul. He will not even let it into his guardhouse. If anyone tells him, here's relativism, if anyone tells him that some pleasures belong to the beautiful and good desires, others to those which are vile, um, some he should practice and respect, others he should chasten and enslave, at all such warnings he nods his head up and down and says, not at all, all are equal, all are respected equally. You know, anybody ever driven around like a campus town? Little kids playing hacky sack? You try to say, well, you know, there's something. Like, you can't reason. Like, no, no, that's just your opinion. No, there's, there's good and bad. No, it's just the man. He says, and so he spends his life, now think about this. I want you to think about the young. And so he spends his life every day indulging the desire that comes along. Think about when they go off to school, okay? They get into, little, they get into their um, different trends. He says, now he drinks deep and toodles at the pipes. Then he drinks water and goes in for slimming. At times, bodily exercise. At times, idleness and complete carelessness. Sometimes he makes a show of studying philosophy. He starts wearing the little black turtlenecks. Oh, I'm cool now, right? Because he says, often he appears in politics and jumps up and says whatever comes into his head. Occupy Wall Street. 
I remember when I used to teach at the University of Kentucky, there was this, um, does anybody know what straight edge is? Anybody? No, 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 no. These are, these are like the militant vegans, okay? And the thing is, it was a, it's a big deal among like a large co college campuses. And what it does, I figured, they really, they really take this like crazy. Um, straight edge, they're like militant vegans. And I figured out what was wrong with them because they've never been taught right or wrong. And so, but they crave something. And so it's basically, it substitutes religion for them. And I remember that what we had at that, that this time, again, large government expenditures. Um, at that time, we, I was in charge of what they called a, a mini college. We had 120 students that we were over. And the university said, here's $4,500. You're to spend it on your students once a semester on dinners. By the way, I never spent that. I think I spent $6. OK, but anyway. <laughs> but why, and I'll tell you what I spent the $6 on. We had the kids to bring lunches. We we're going to have a picnic. And I thought, we have a lot of those vegan kids, those straight edgers. I'll buy some honey. See, I was trying to be all polit politically correct, you know, because, you know, they may not like sugar because I'm sure somebody's being oppressed making the sugar. So I have the honey. I'm really trying. I'm trying to be all nice and liberal and multicultural. And I bring the honey and I said, well, I know you guys. Are. So I brought honey and, and they were like, we can't have that. I, I, this is the answer. I promise this is the answer. He says, no, we can't have that. That's bee oppression. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. Anyway, but again, this is what happens, okay? Now, you, got this, you know, there's no, he says, he says this, he says, there is no discipline or necessity in life, but he calls this delightful, full of blessings, and he follows it all day. He says, so you see this variegated man full of all sorts of conditions and manners. This is the beautiful, multicolored man, exactly like the city, one whose life a man and many a woman would envy, having himself patterns and innumerable constitutions of, character, of, of characters. In other words, multiculturalism, all this he comes in. Now, he goes on, he says, First of all, then, they are free men. He talks, this is when we get into the Democratic man. He says, they are free men. The city is full of freedom and liberty of speech, and men may do it as they like. In fact, um, this is the most beautiful of constitutions. It is decked out with all sorts of conditions of manners. A, let's see, a robe of many colors is embroidered. Um, with it, all the flowers of the field. And what could be more beautiful? Yes, perhaps many would judge it to be the most beautiful. He goes on, he says, no necessity to be governed here. In other words, you don't have to tell, nobody can tell you what to do. He says, even if you are fit for it, no need to be ruled over if you don't like it. You need not go to war if, uh, let's see, if they fight. Uh, you need not keep the peace if others keep it for you, unless you desire peace. If a law forbids you to be a magistrate or a judge, you may be a magistrate or a judge all the same. So in other words, you know, yeah, executive orders. Okay, goes on. He says, um, he says uh, yeah, he says, what a lovely heavenly life while it lasts. Toleration. No worry in a democracy about trifles. What contempt on the solemn proclamations we made in the founding of our city, that no one could become a good man unless he had the superlative of nature, unless from a boy he should play among beautiful things and study beautiful practices. Again, what he's saying is, there's no order. There's no order. You know, how can you expect this if you haven't been, even from a little child, played with the right things, all this? It's kind of like this. How many of you have I have, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, okay? How many of you go through the toy departments at like Walmart or something? Yeah. Have you ever seen the brat stalls? You know what's going to happen. What's going to happen is like you buy in the brat stalls and when they're 16, why is my 16-year-old a tart? You bought her a brat stall. Okay. In other words, you have to pay attention to the upbringing. Um, you know, this is, but this is something that people don't think about again. And my, Molly Saris, that's right. I mean, you know, the same type of thing. And he goes on. Um, and he says this. He says, these things then, and much like them are in a democracy, a delightful constitution it would seem, be seen, no governor and plenty of color, equally, equality of a sort, distributed to equal and unequal alike. Now that's key. Here's one. I always ask my students this. They get mad. But then they say, yeah, you're right, after they think about it. Why is it an 18-year-old has as much say-so in election as a 60-year-old who pays a mortgage. But that's an abstract. They haven't. Does that make sense? In other words, if a person did military service, that's different. 
That's it. But again, we don't think about this. What we've done is, is we've made all opinions equal. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. And they expect. And remember, we've already lost, thanks to this, we've already lost the teaching of the difference between right and wrong. It's all focused on stuff. And now they've grown up with stuff. And they expect stuff. They expect it continually. Now, let's go on and see how we get, though, from this to this. Okay. Yeah, that's just it. Yeah, that's, that's probably Okay, and he talks basically about a democracy, what you're going to have in a democracy. He says there's three cl classes of people. He says, by the way, I'm gonna, I'll just go out over these instead of reading them to you. One part, basically, are wealthy people. Okay. And he says those are the ones that have been the most frugal. Now, again, they might have brought us the oligarchy, but they still have frugality. Okay. He says the other part are the masses who really aren't politically aware or could care less, mainly because they're just busy. He says the third part is almost like a professional politician part. He calls them the drones. And he says what they do is, is they were wealthy. They were expected. They were the children of these. They've blown it all now. But they still would like wealth. And, and they like power. And he says the only way they can get power is they're dependent upon energizing the masses. <coughs> he says, but the masses won't be energized. He calls the masses drones. He says the only reason they ever get excited about anything is, he compares them to bees, if they can get a little honey. That's it. But the way that they have to, the, the way they can energize people is promise people stuff, that that's the only way they can, they can energize people. And this is what he says, so he goes on. And I'm not gonna read all this to you, I'm just gonna go give you the short version and then we'll get to where this ends. Now. Um, he says what basically happens, though, is this. Eventually, the way they move up is they take stuff. They have to, re they have to take stuff from the people who have it and redistribute it. And they give them goodies, and they're, re and they're elected, and they're elected, and they're elected. And this is how they build up their stuff. And he says this. He goes on. I will say this part. He says, he goes on. He says, well, it does get a bit from time to time. He says, depending on the ability of the politicians, and, and talking about the masses, and taking the property away from those who have it and distributing it among the people to keep most of it for themselves. Okay. In other words, they're going to make sure to take advantage of it too. Now, he goes on and on. He says, the problem is eventually the wealthy will figure this out. Hey, <laughs> they're taking our stuff. And what, we'll do, what they'll do is, is they'll also now have to say enough, and they'll become active in politics. And he says, that's when it gets much more dangerous. He says, because on the one hand, you have this professional pol political class who have all these benefits, who enjoy this power, and their power is based on popular appeal, but the popular appeal of the masses is bought at what cost? Taxes. He says, and on the other ha half, you see the ones who are getting taxed, who are tired. And he says, they'll become politically active. And he says, the problem is politics becomes much more vicious because it becomes a matter of protecting what you have. The political class don't want to lose being in power. The other class doesn't want to lose their wealth. And it becomes much more vicious. And by the way, this is, if you ever get a chance, I'm going to read this to you. Go back and read sometime Washington's Federal Address, and he warns about party. And he says, this is the danger. You'll know you're near the end when you go back and forth between the parties. Because you cannot afford to lose, because if you do lose, you're out. I'll give you an example of this, where this is going. I used to teach at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And there was a guy whose office was next to mine, and he had been a former parliament member in Nigeria. He was a political science professor. And um, he was explaining to me how politics operated in Nigeria. He says, this is why, he says, this is why African politics are, are messy. He says, what happens is you have a village, and um, the village will be, it'll be really poor. He says, a lot of people there will save up their money, and they'll try to find some 
kid from that village who, who has some promise, and they'll send him to university. He said, well, that seems nice. You know, you're going to help this kid along. He said, the problem is, he says, what, what will happen is, is that kid will go off to the university, and in return, what they expect is he will get a government job. And once he gets a government job and becomes a government bureaucrat, what is he supposed to do? Send more goodies back down to the village. And if you look at this, if you look, by the way, this is true in most of the world, OK? Well, not most of the world. In large parts of the world, middle class are the government employees. That that basically is what is, is how you move up in society. And so to lose an election, if a party were to lose an election, you're not losing just an election. You're losing your place in society. This is when it gets danger, is when the biggest part of your economy, your biggest engine of your economy, becomes the government. That's the danger. That goes on. And of course, what he says is, he says, eventually, this guy, he says, eventually, what will happen is, is you will have a person claiming to be a champion of the people, OK? And he's going to basically save the people from the rich. And here's what he says. He says, um, yeah, uh, he says, when the protector of the people finds a very obedient mob, when he drags someone into court by the usual unjust accusations, uh, when he hits at the abolition of debts and partition of estates, surely for such a one the necessity is ordained that he must either perish at the hands of his enemies or become a tyrant and be a wolf instead of a man. He says, this is the man then who comes to lead the party against those who possess property. He goes on. Hold on. Yeah. He says, um, now, now the thing is, I don't want to find this right here. Um, yeah. So what he'll do is, is, he'll, is he'll keep people lined up on his side by giving them goodies. And he'll ask for a bodyguard, okay, and all of this. And then eventually, though, he runs, you know, by the way, if you tax the rich, you can do that, okay. But the thing is, you, that'll only get you so far, okay. That's going to run out. Then what's next? Well, he says, next what we'll do is, is we'll start using, and he says, you'll seize the temples, treasuries, you'll seize all this. We don't have that, but we do have things like natural resources. Okay, that'll be the next thing. Okay, he talks about the natural resources. By the way, look who gets our coal, our timber, and all that. See if it goes to the U.S. or where it goes. Then he says this, but eventually what's going to happen? Eventually you've got people hooked to these things. You've still got to pay for it. Who are you eventually going to have to tax? There's, by the way, we're already there. Yeah. By the way, we're already there ahead of time because unlike the Greeks, you know, they're the wealthy, we're in the city. For ours, very wealthy can hide their stuff. We have to basically pay this. And so eventually they have to tax the people. Okay. Now, the problem is once you've done that, what does that mean? Well, if you're going to have to turn on the people, but you still need popular support, you've got to find a new constituency. And here's what he says. He says, but look here, what if the people object? Um, oh, sorry, that's not it, sorry, that's the wrong one. Good. Yeah, sorry, sorry, oh, wrong one. Um, da, 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 da. Hold on, sorry. Well, I can tell you regardless, I was gonna read it for you directly because it's because if it comes straight from him, it's, it almost sounds like you're talking about nowadays and I've got to, uh, sorry. Anyway, basically what he says is the next group you're going to get, he says, the next thing that he'll do basically is he will start enrolling, he'll say, into the citizenry. Remember, this is ancient Greece. He'll start enrolling slaves and foreigners. Now, we don't have slaves in this country. But, well, but nowadays, but where can you turn for a new constituency? You've got to find somebody totally dependent on you. That's it. You've got to find a class that's totally dependent on you. Be leery of politicians who want to keep bringing people in as new constituents. Because what that means is the old constituency is not happy. And so you have to find a new constituency that will always back you. That's it. And again, and again, I, I was going to find the quote for you here, but here's the thing. This is Plato 2,500 years ago. This is the plan, OK? He goes on, so 2,500 years ago, same thing. There you go. By the way, let's see how this ends. He, so, so eventually what, what happens is this. Uh, eventually, um, uh, you know, people are going to get upset. And he, and he says, uh, and of course, remember, what this basically means is the father of tyranny is democracy. 
Okay, remember mob rule. And, and he says, well, you know, aren't people going to get upset at this? And he says, and this is the next thing he says, um, yeah, he says, um, oops, yeah, he says, uh, there it is. He goes on, he says, um, but look here, what if the people object and say that a grown up son, now remember, who's, this is the democracy saying this, a grown up son, who are they talking to? The tyrant, right? He said, yeah, he says, but look here, what if the people object and say that a grown-up son um, cannot fairly ask that his father, uh, let's see, his father to keep him? But the opposite, the son ought to keep the father. In other words, where's my social security? In other words, we brought you into power. He goes on, he says, he says, and he didn't beget the brat and set him on his feet only to be a slave to his own slaves when the boy grew up and to have the support, let's see, to have to support the boy himself and the slaves along with the rabble of foreigners. He meant that his son, his son to be a protector and to get free from the rich. Again, isn't that what some opportunists in this country say? Elect me and I'll you know, protect you there. He says, now he is telling him to get out of the city and his companions too, like a father turning his sons out of the, out of the doors with a drunken company who are making Mary, uh, Mary, Mary a nuisance. He says, ah, oh, then the people will find out by God just what they are and what a monster they have bred and nursed in their bosom and raised to greatness and that they, the weaker, are now talking of throwing out the stronger. He says, what's that you say? Will the tyrant dare use violence against his father and thrash him if he won't obey him? Yes, after taking away his arms. 2,500 years ago. There you go. He says, and this is how he ends it. He says, we have tyranny here unconcealed. The people will run from the smoke into the fire, as the proverb goes, from slavery under the free man into despotism under slaves. That perfect and unseasonable liberty has been exchanged for a new dress, the cruel and most bitter slavery under slaves. And so there's his end right there. And I think you can see it's still relevant. Anyway, that's it. Any questions? There is no silver lining. <laughs> now, the change basically is this. Where does it all go wrong? Huh? Inside of us. If we can no longer distinguish right and wrong, if we can no longer control our appetites, notice, the people get this because they can't control their appetites. They expect more, 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 more. None at all. Now, what I'm going to do next month is this. I'll talk about when this change came about because the ancients all knew this. They knew it starts from within. It starts at the individual level of responsibility. What I'm going to look at next month is we're going to look at Machiavelli and see how he changed the meaning of politics. How politics didn't become about self-control, but about institutions and things of that nature. Yeah? Yeah, there actually, there is a silver line. Yeah, well, for, for 50 years, um, our, our culture has rejected God, and I mean, we're seeing the result of that. You know, if, if we look at God's protection as, as an umbrella, well, our nation and our culture has stepped out, out of that covering. And so the silver lining is repentance, and for those of us who profess um, to know Christ, to return, to get on our knees, to pray for repentance, and for our pastors, our preachers, to actually start preaching truth, preaching about sin, preaching about righteousness, because God's clear that if the nation will turn back to him, then he'll heal the land. But I don't think we're going to see healing until the nation... And again, I want, I want to stress this, and I see this as a college professor on a secular university, I'll still say this. It's getting the point when we... We have a class right now called Ideology and Mass Culture in the Modern World, and we look at the Declaration of Independence, we, we, look, we look at the French Revolution too, and we compare the French Revolution and the American Revolution. And the difference, the one big difference, one of the big differences is this. You know, the French Revolution, where do your rights come from in the French Revolution? Man. 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 And it sounds, it sounds great. It sounds like great, like, oh, we're all free. It comes from the bottom up. There has to be an absolute standard. There has to be an absolute standard. And, you can, and once you mention that, even, and I have a lot of atheists in class, and they still get it. Yeah, there does have to be an absolute standard. There has to be something above just the majority. Because again, if you believe 
if you believe that right and wrong are determined simply by majority rule, then what you also must acknowledge is chopping up little Tutsi children in the 1990s was a just act because the majority was for it. You know, there has to be something higher. Yeah. That's right. So it's all relative. Yeah, if it's all relative, then it, if there's if there's no absolute, we're lost. Here's the one thing. My favorite, not because I agree with him, it's, it's, it's terribly frightening, but my favorite atheist philosopher by far, the only one I admire, uh, he's horrible, okay, I want to stress it, but I'll explain why I admire him, is Nietzsche. Because Nietzsche takes it off. He basically says, yeah, someday politics will be on the grand scale and everything will burn. I mean, he even admits it's all doomed. Does that make sense? And that's what you have. He admits this. That's, that's, he's the honest one. He's not, he, it's a horrible thing to look at, but he's honest about it. Does that make sense? And the thing is, what happens is, deep down, everybody knows, no, there has to be an absolute. Because if you actually look at, like, what do they call them now, the new atheists of Dawkins and all that? If you actually look at them, I'm not defending them, but if you actually look at them, they want to believe there's something bigger because, oh, well, we'll evolve to a higher form. Well, that's not the way evolution works. But anyway, but even they have to think there's got to be something. They know that there has to be a higher standard. They just won't acknowledge it. But there has to be. I mean, there's no way to get around it. There has to be. Because if not, it's the lowest common denominator. There's the math answer for you. <laughs> yeah. Now, the thing is, though, you can hold out. You know, you, they, some of them do get refurbished a few <laughs> There is another thing, and I'll, I'll do these. I'll do these three things. But if you ever want me back, I actually had, did another talk for 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 one time, talking about the limitations in a republic, talking about a republic and where it functions the best. And it is a matter of scale. Uh, there, there, there is a way, even for the U.S. Here's the thing. Here, sorry, me. Here's the thing, and, and this is a longer thing. This will take an hour. But one of the things that we talked. I, no, 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 I won't do this. I'll, I'll, I'll wet your appetite. Here's what we were looking at, and I'll explain what the, what the context was on this. Um, the context was, was um, on, on the Pledge of Allegiance, can you say a nation? That was the context. And, and, but Randy Brock didn't, didn't want to use the word nation. And I said, well, he wasn't completely wrong. I said, because a nation implies you're all on the same page. You can't have a union of 300 million. You can have a country of 300 million. But having a unified body of 300 million, republics have a limit. People have to have certain things in common. Now, it doesn't mean, I'm not, I want to stress this, I'm not advocating, I'm not a neo-confederate break up the country, I don't mean that. But the fact is, you cannot have centralization, a centralized society at 300 million. And I think this is the danger in our politics, both Democrats and Republicans, is the idea that we want an answer. Well, what works here is not going to work in New York City. What works, you could even do this at the state level. I was, I was very happy when, when, Hoff, when um, I, my, my mind just went blank, Hoff, Hoffmeister won. But I made this comment. I said, the fact is, that is an impossible job. It is doomed to failure. Because the idea is we will have a superintendent of higher ed that will come up with a model for the state. One of my jobs is, is I oversee student teachers and I go to a lot of different schools. I go all the way to, to the north side of Oklahoma City. I go to, to uh, majority black ones, majority Hispanic ones, large universities, small, I mean, a lot, uh, large schools, small little urban, rural schools, different suburban schools, and here's the answer I have to give you. There is never an answer. There is not a unified answer that will work everywhere. The only thing you can do with school accountability, I would say, this would cost money, but not as much, if you want to do this. I'm not saying you have to do this. If you want that, the only type of accountability you can have would basically be this. You could take statistics, 
where you say, where you try to keep up with graduates and say, okay, after five years, how many have a job? How many are in college? How many have gone to grad school? How many are in the military? You could keep those statistics. And then you could report those back to those districts. And then the people, the local people, the local school boards could say, is this acceptable or not? Because the answers may vary. You know, if you're in Norman and you've got all these people that are like, professionals and college professors, and you, and you come back saying, well, 70% of your students are going to college. They'll say, only 70%, you know, and, and okay. Whereas if I, and I'm not knocking this, I actually love this town, but if you went out to Seaman, Oklahoma, and you said 30% are going to college, you're thinking, why are those 30% wasting their time? I mean, so, so the point is, it has to be decided, people have to decide what is, you know, there, there, there's different answers, and again, what makes people happy? Some people may want money. Some people may want a simple life. That's not me to judge. That's not for me to judge. You can't have it. The Supreme Court has said the public has to pay for the education of the individuals. They created the foreign class. That's right. That was the fall of the Greeks Plato talking about. That's it. Here's the one thing we have to return to, and this is key. We have to return to this. As any elected official, if you are a federal official, if you're a federal official, if you're president of the United States, what is your only concern? No, no, what should it be? You ask what's your job, what is your only concern? It's the Constitution and it's the country. It's not the world. If you are a state representative, or a state senator, you look at what, look at, that's it. Well, and in fact, if we did this at, for congressmen, if you are a U.S. congressman, your concern is your district. Now, this is where it gets dicey. If you're a U.S. senator, the way it was designed and still the intention. So if you're a representative, I should be caring about what you, if, if I'm your representative, I need to care what you're thinking, okay? If I'm your senator, what should be my only concern, your state, your U.S. senator? what the state legislature says. And that's the way it was set up, yeah. And, and there is a reason for that because states have interest. They did. And once you've lost that, that's, that's when it gets to be un awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Hey, thank you.